So we're going to continue in the series that we've been in for a little bit on the life of David. We're going to be in 1 Samuel um, 28 and 31 today, if you have your Bibles and want to go ahead and turn there, you can go ahead and do so. Uh, we're continuing in this series on the life of David, where we are taking a look at the hand of God and the complexity of his life. This is one of the things that we kind of identify with a little bit in his life. I think you see a lot of highs and lows, uh, successes and failures, wins and losses and things like that. And so up until now, we've been taking a look at where God's hand is moving specifically in his life. Today, I want to shift that attention a little bit to King Saul and take a look at some of the warnings uh, around the demise of his life and how God's hand is working in Saul uh, and, and, and working kind of really through the, the failures of Saul uh, to shape David and all of us here today. And so I've titled this one, Warning. Uh, I'll just kind of put that one out there and say it was a little bit more effective if I was preaching it last week during Halloween week, and a little bit more scary, that kind of a thing. But that kind of is how this storyline and the end of 1 Samuel is going to wrap up. It's how it's going to function really as a warning around the kind of empty religiosity uh, that come, has come to define much of Saul's life. And so I think we kind of get this. I know it can feel a little bit heavy kind of hearing a, hey, warning, warning, warning kind of a deal, but I think we get some of the value of warnings in our life that they're leading us not just away from something over here, but into something brand new over here. Uh, a few weeks back, Caleb and I came across a hilarious one. We were shopping for his Halloween costume. At that point in time, he was wanting to be Chip Gaines, for Halloween because like demo day is awesome and it's like, hey, you get to like destroy things and build things new and this is a big deal. And so we were out there hunting for a Halloween costume and uh, we were, uh, I was going to make him something. We were at Hobby Lobby and we came across these, you know, these iron on letters for a demo day shirt, t-shirt we were going to make. And he grabs the package and he comes over. He's like, dad, look at this warning label on the, on the front of this package. And it says, warning, don't iron on while wearing. And I was like, <laughs> Oh my gosh. I was like, that's incredible. And then it obviously hit me. You're like, okay, I guess these warning uh, tags are necessary because evidently somebody's done that at some point in time, right? And I'm sitting there going like, I get this in College Station. Uh, I don't know about like Dallas though. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I'm just, as an Aggie, I can say that. No one else can say that and everything. But uh, uh, I think we get some of the value of these tags. Come back and find out Forbes magazine has a competition every single year for some of the dumbest warning labels that are out there. And obviously what's crazy about them is that people have actually done these things. And so here's a few of them that I thought were absolutely hilarious. But one came out, and I love this, it says, don't hold the wrong end of a chainsaw. And so um, if you've ever needed a tag to tell you that, um, you know... Ouch. Like that's just, uh, that hurts a little bit right there. Uh, I love this one. Accessory only. Don't use as a battle device for your lightsaber. I know some of you guys go to those conventions and everything and you think they're actually real weapons. They are not. And they are not going to do any, uh, any good for you when somebody breaks into your house. Uh, I love that one. But then the last one I love was uh, this one. Remove child before folding. Uh, <laughs> So if you've ever lost a kid and you're going, I don't know where they may be, you may want to go check that thing out. Anybody ever done that before? You start like folding it in, maybe you're still asleep. Uh, I'm glad no hands went up right there. Um, I think we get the point that it's not always obvious what it is that we're supposed to do. And it's not always obvious to everyone which direction it is that we're supposed to go. David Kenneman in his research around cultural Christianity, uh, he writes about this a lot, about a lot of well-intentioned uh, Christians, people bearing the mark of Christian, Christ follower. Uh, and he says in his research around cri cultural Christianity that somewhere around 50% of Americans are still acknowledging that they have prayed something similar to a sinner's prayer where they have identified with Christ, received his life, death, and resurrection as a substitute for their own, and they are Christ followers to some degree or another. Somewhere around another 50% of those same group of people uh, will not attend church other than Christmas or Easter. Roughly the same 50% believe that the Bible is flat out wrong in what it has to say. And nearly 67% of those same believers uh, functionally live by a worldview that isn't even trying to be biblical. And so Saul's life is going to come, and his essentially it's going to warn us about a type of empty religiosity that is not able to produce any Life. It's what Billy Graham has often talked about many times in the past when he used to say that a lot of people uh, would miss out on heaven by about 18 inches because they acknowledged a lot of the right things about God in their head, but it never traveled those 18 inches down into their heart. 
And so I want to look at some of these warnings around here to say, okay, what's the difference between Saul and David and where he's really leading us in the fulfillment uh, in Christ and stuff. But like, what is he teaching us here in these warnings around uh, Saul's life? We see in this passage, his, his life is going to end tragically. And so what is it in these warnings? We're going to see that this is the hand of God, not only in David's wife, life to kind of give him an awareness of, hey, here's where he's leading you away from, but also then what he's leading us into. So again, 1 Samuel 28 is where I want to pick up. If you're not familiar with the story, we're picking it up in this time in Israel's history where um, they had no king, right? They had no king. Saul is the first king. And so we read at the end of Judges that in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. And so the people came and they inquired of God. They said, God, can we not have a king like our neighbors do? All of the people around us have kings. They have good looking kings. They have kings they can be proud of. They have kings that'll fight on their behalf. And God's like, I am that king for you. We're in that relationship. I'm your provider and things like that. And they're like, well, it's not good enough for us. And so uh, God essentially relents, and he basically says, okay, I will give you the king that you've asked for. However, it's not going to work out as well as you think. And this is the provision of King Saul. Saul is the head and shoulders above the rest, people's choice award for king. Uh, he's the one that won the popular vote, probably, the one that you can look up to, easily say, yeah, that's my king. And uh, for the first 15, 20 years, things are going really, really well. Uh, he's faithful to God. God's blessing is on his life. But then Saul goes the way of many kings after him who go and look around at the kingdom and begin to think, okay, this whole thing is about me. The pride begins to set in. He starts going his own way. He starts taking matters into his own hands, disregarding partially the things of God. And God's favor is removed from his life. And so he removes his favor and his blessing. And we're going to get into some of that here today. But this is when he anoints David. David comes in. He's anointed by God to be the next king. And there's this long period between when the time of the anointing takes place and when he actually assumes the throne. And so he comes and develops a friendship with Jonathan, Saul's son. They become friends. Saul gets, gets kind of really crazy, starts going after David and trying to kill him uh, for the latter part of his years. And so as we get to chapter 28, that season of life is wrapping up. Uh, it's been about six years of running for David, and uh, Saul's kind of done with it, five attempts on his life. And um, we're picking it up in chapter 28. It's towards the very end of this whole thing. Saul and David are different parts of the country at this point in time, and David is now in the middle of a Philistine raid. And so that's kind of where we're going to pick it up here in chapter 28. We read in verse 3 that Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. If you were with us a couple weeks ago in chapter 25, same statement about Samuel right there. Uh, very small. Um, I don't know if Samuel's looking at being like, could we not get a little bit more detail right there? But that's all that's said about his death right there is that it's repeated again in 28. Samuel was dead. All of Israel mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Then it continues and it says that Saul had expelled the mediums and the spiritists from the land. And this is where it's going to get a little bit weird, but we see that this is actually one of these good things that Saul is doing. He's being obedient to the word of God. He's expelled the mediums and the spiritists, which is in line with what Deuteronomy, uh, with what God says through Moses in Deuteronomy when he makes it clear. Mediums, he says, spiritists, people who practice child sacrifices, is what the text says, divination, sorcery, witchcraft, they're not to be tolerated in the land. Because what, here it is, while the nations may listen to him is what he says, while the nations may listen to those voices, God's people should be set apart and only listen to him. And so that's the rule of law. Saul is here, he's a believer in Yahweh, he's being faithful to expel them from the land. But it continues and says this, when Saul saw that the Philistine army setting up camp around them, he was afraid and terror filled his heart. And so he inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or by prophets or by Urim. Again, which is another weird thing for us to think about today, this side of the new covenant, having the fullness of God's word, the indwelling Holy Spirit. But keep in mind, thousands of years back, this is actually an approved uh, way for people to discern the will of God. Uh, we read about in Exodus 28, Numbers 27, uh, they would go and they would inquire of God through prophets, through different priests, through visions, signs, and dreams, and things like that. And they would often sometimes use Urim, which is, again, approved in Exodus 28 and Numbers 27, which you can think about kind of like an Old Testament, maybe it's like a magic eight ball or something like that. It kind of looks like two different dice, 
You may roll them. One side says yes, no. You get double yeses. You kind of know, hey, this is the way to go over here. You get double no. This is kind of a blockade. Don't go down that path. You get a yes and a no, and this is going to be kind of a God, God coming and saying, okay, um, not yet. You need to chill a little bit. You need to keep pursuing me. I'm not going to give you the specifics here. This is one of these moments I want you to walk by faith and things like that. And so this is what's happening here with Saul. He's inquiring of God, but he's at this point in time when God's not responding to him back. You ever been frustrated at the voice of God or the timing of God sometimes? Maybe you've come and you've been like, okay, Lord, I need leadership here. I need wisdom and direction, but it seems like all I keep getting is silence on, and nothing back. It could be a frustrating place to be. And this is Saul. It says that he starts to get really impatient. And this is the way that Saul often goes. He starts believing and actually thinking, hey, I am entitled to the voice of God leading me all the time. I'm entitled to know where it is you want me to go. I'm entitled to your blessing. I'm entitled to your power. I'm entitled to all these different kinds of things. He's not getting it in the moment. And so he's getting impatient and saying, okay, enough is enough. It's time for me to do what I need to do. And so he says to one of his attendants, he says, find me a woman, verse 7, who is a medium, so that I may go and inquire of her. And so they told him about a witch living in Endor, uh, one of the long lost distant cousins of the Ewoks. And so um, I love that that actually came up during Halloween week, week, witch living in Endor, Ewoks, the forest, moon of Endor, anyway. Um, Verse 8, so Saul disguised himself, putting on older clothes, other clothes. And at night, he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said. Bring up for me the one that I name. But the woman, not knowing that it was Saul, said to him, Surely you know what Saul's done. He's cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for me by bringing, uh, why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord and said, As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. A uh, very bold move to speak on behalf of God when he has clearly spoken about what not to do regarding mediums and spiritists. Uh, then the woman says to him, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said, which is another bold move to bring up the prophet who predicted his demise. But anyway, verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You're Saul. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. Tell me what you see. And the woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. And then Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed down and he prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me. God's departed from me. He no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams. And so I've called on you to tell me what to do. Uh, Real quick, what should you do uh, if God's not working on your time frame? Uh, The answer is not this. (laughs) Like, just leave it at that. Not this. You wait a little bit longer. You consult a friend. You talk to your pastor, your community group. You keep seeking the word. You just wait and you wait and you wait. You don't go the way that God has clearly told you not to go. And again, this is Saul's M.O. I can't wait. I'm impatient. You know who I am. I'm going to do things my way. And so look at what Samuel says to him next. He says, Samuel, Samuel says, why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and he's given it to one of your neighbors, to David. And here's why. Because you didn't obey the Lord or carry out his wrath against the Amalekites. That's why the Lord has done this to you today. In other words, Saul, you stopped listening to me a long time ago. In other words, Saul, you, you say you want my direction, but then you disregard it all the time. Saul, I've, we've had this conversation before, man. And you go partially there, but then you turn around and you do your own thing. Like, Saul, we've gone down this path. Why would I continue to enable you and to make you believe that we're okay when you just go off and you go and do whatever it is that you want to do? And it's good for us to understand as we're looking at this part of Saul's story right here, that there's a lot that's going on in his life. It's not just uh, one-off little instances. This is a whole long time 
of all kinds of things, blatant disobedience to God, self-reliance, narcissistic pride and impatience. I mean, you go all the way back to chapter 13, and this is when we start seeing some of it recorded. But uh, we see this scene where he's waiting on Samuel to arrive to make, the, to make the, the sacrifices. He's about to go and engage the Philistines again in battle. He's waiting on Samuel, who's the priest, to come and to make the sacrifices before God. Uh, Samuel's running a little bit late, which is easy to probably do when hey, you don't have a cell phone, you don't have text messaging. Yeah, like you're traveling miles and miles and miles on unpaid roads to get there. You're probably going to be late from time to time. Samuel's a little bit late, and Saul's sitting there kind of going, we can't wait on this guy. I'm going to take matters into my own hands, and I'm going to make these sacrifices myself. Never mind the fact that God had specifically said only priests are allowed to make these sacrifices before God. They are the mediators between a holy God and a sinful man, and that's the way that it's supposed to be done. And Saul completely disregards the entire thing and says, I can't wait on you anymore. I'm taking matters into my own hands, and he plays loose with the holiness of God. A few verses later, we see that they go into battle. God still gives them grace and mercy, delivers them to the hands of the Philistines, and go. And, um, and so Saul comes back, and you know what he does? He builds a monument to himself. He comes out of this incredible victory that God had delivered him out of, and he comes back, and he goes, and he builds a monument to himself so that everybody can give praise to the king who delivered the people that day. All praise and glory be to Saul, the mighty king of all kings. And this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about in Saul's life. You get to chapter 15, and he doesn't wipe out the Amalekites like God had told him to do. It may seem a little bit weird for us to read something like that, but keep in mind the Amalekites uh, were the evil entities of the day, the ones child sacrifices, massive violence against innocent, men, women, and children left and right. God's judgment was upon the Amalekites. God had told Saul, go wipe them all out completely clean. And Saul goes in and says, you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do. I'll take out some of them. God tells them, hey, don't plunder the land. Don't take any livestock. Don't take any things for yourself. Leave it all there, Saul says. But guess what? They're cows and they're goats and they're sheep. And oh my gosh, have you ever had a steak before? It's incredible. And he goes and he takes these animals. And you remember what we read in chapter 15. Samuel looks at him. It's like, what in the world are you doing with these goats and these sheep and these, and these cows? And you remember like Saul blatantly lies to him and says, yeah, they were for the sacrifices. You needed something to sacrifice to God, right? Kind of puts that Jesus holy spin on it and everything. No, 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 this is for him, right? And he's just lying about it left and right. And this is when God decides to remove his favor from Saul. And of course, at that point in time, this favor is removed from Saul. He's really, really sorry about it. He does what a lot of sorry people do. They cry, God, forgive me. I'm really, really sorry. I'll never do it again. I'm really, really sorry. Then the problem is, that even though he's really, really sorry, he never actually repents. And so instead of supporting David and the God's anointing upon his life, you see this contrast play out between Saul and his son, Jonathan. Jonathan, who would have been the rightful heir to the throne, the one who's also impacted by his father Saul's sin against the Lord, he rightly understands the hand of God on David's blessing. He submits to it and says, I see where God is moving. All glory, honor, and praise to the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. I will support my friend David because I see God's hand over here. Saul rejects it continues to walk in, in, uh, in, in unrepentance and defiance against the things of God. And he goes and he continues to try to kill David because he sees him as a threat to the throne for the rest of his days. Even right here in the text, he rightly removes the, the, the mediums and the witches. And uh, then he just stops waiting on the Lord. And he turns to a witch for direction. And so God comes to this point in Saul's life where he says, Saul, no more blessing for you. No more blessing for you. No more wisdom, no more power. You don't get to hear from me whenever you want. I'm, not, I'm just, just not at your becking call to kind of give you all the things that you want. And it's a sober warning for us today and a good, for, good one for us to sit here and to remember that I'm not entitled to anything. I'm not entitled to the throne. You're not entitled to the throne. You're not entitled to the responsibilities that he's graciously given to us. It's good for us to sit here and to remember I'm not entitled to his immediate responses, to always getting clarity in every single moment of life that I'm always going to have the blessed thing coming my way. 
It's good to remember that I'm not entitled to his always active voice in my life. And beyond that, to recognize that if I continue in unrepentant sin, much like Saul does here in this text, he could choose to remove a blessing that I've grown accustomed to having. And you know what that feels like? When something that I've grown entitled to, a blessing that I've become accustomed to, has been removed from my life, it feels like a condemnation. It's not a condemnation. It's a removal of a blessing. But it feels like a condemnation. We know that that's not what he's talking about right here. We know that in Scripture, it's going to say in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. We understand that salvation is a gift of God's grace that is given to us by faith. Genuine repentant faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so all of those things are absolutely true. However, it is also true that none of that means that we are entitled to the fullness of life which he came to bring. And it's good for us to sit here from time to time and to be like, you know what? All of the different things that are in my life, all of these good things, God, I'm not entitled to any of it. I praise God that you've chosen to give it anyway, but I do recognize that life is found on the flip side of repentance. And none of the things that I have, I'm entitled to. For the past couple of weeks, as we've been diving into this text with staff and people around me and stuff, we just kept, kept sitting here in this text, in this sobering reality, sitting in offices, Warren and Molly, as we're dissecting this text, just sitting here going, God, I'm not entitled to it. When was the last time you had that prayer with the Lord? As you sat there and you thought about the blessings that are in your life, the good things that are in your life, the things that bring you joy, the incredible things, and just been like, God, I'm not entitled. I'm not entitled to this job that I love all the time. I'm not entitled to the pulpit. I'm not entitled to all these different things. Think about some of the different stories that we hear all the time. Fallen pastors, fallen leaders, who start off really, really well and don't make it the long haul. Broken marriages that start off in bliss, cloud nine, not making it very long. Broken families, close proximity, parents, kids, love, joy, close fellowship, not lasting for the long haul. Financial ruin, fruitless lives, Starting off strong, walking with him, serving him, seeing God move left and right all over the place, only for it to not last. I'm thinking of the exiles that are in Babylonian captivity, the original audience of this book right here. They would have received this while they were in Babylonian captivity. And all of the different believers in God, the people of God, chosen by God, who are learning that even though they are all of those things, they're not entitled to his constant, always blessing. And this is how we've been praying for the past couple weeks. God, I'm just remembering. Not entitled to any of this. Not entitled to the marriage that I enjoy and that I look forward to coming home to all the time. I'm not entitled to the children and the home life that we've come to enjoy. I'm not entitled to the freedom that we've come to live in. Not entitled to the safety and to the health and to the friendships and to the job and to the environment and to the responsibilities that he's given to you to the standard of living that he's given to you, which is the top 1% in the entire world, not entitled to any of these things, not entitled to the moment-by-moment perfect wisdom and direction of God, like Saul seems to think that he's entitled to. In fact, Scripture is really, really clear that there's a lot of things still today that are able to hinder your prayers. I mean, if you read Amos chapter 5, it'll absolutely terrify you. Amos is going to say, I despise, check this out, I despise your religious festivals, and your assemblies are a stench to me, is what God says. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. That's why we've always got to be engaging the justice conversations, no matter the political complexities all around it today, entering it and saying, God, what does your righteousness and justice look like in these cultural moments that we're in today? James is going to say that the double-minded man, the doubter is what it means right there, the one who sort of believes, sort of doesn't believe, the one who's kind of going, hey, I'm just going to throw this out there. I don't know if you can do anything about it, but he says the double-minded man shouldn't expect to hear anything from the Lord. 
Peter's going to say to husbands, you should honor your wives and live with them in an understanding way. Why? So that your prayers won't be hindered. In 1 Peter chapter 3, David's going to say in Psalm 66, which I believe is probably in response to what he's seeing in Saul's life play out in front of his eyes, but he's going to say that if I had a cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord wouldn't have listened to me. Point of the matter is, we're not always entitled to the always blessed life. And it's good for us to sit in that sober warning from time to time and to remember these things that I've grown entitled to, these things that I've grown accustomed to, these things that I've come to accept as normal in my life, I'm not always entitled to them. Life is actually found on the flip side of repentance. And it doesn't mean that you're always going to live in perfection. It does not mean that he's not going to lavish grace and mercy on you no matter what or anything like that. But it does mean in these silent seasons of life where Saul finds himself there, the blessing of God has been removed. I'm not having divine access like I used to have divine access, kind of like Saul's experiencing right there. It does mean that it is wise and good for us to consider and to say, okay, God, is there something you're bringing to my attention right here that I need to repent of first? Because life is found on the flip side of repentance. God, is there something that you're trying to grab my attention? I know that I've expressed sorrow, but has that sorrow actually led to repentance? And this is where he gets it wrong, because he's sorry about all kinds of things, but nothing ever changes in his life. There's a type of empty religiosity that doesn't actually lead to life. And so he kicks out the mediums and the spiritists and the witches and all these things. And when that part's great, but you know, he's summoning them like minutes later in his time of need. The irony of this text is that all the way back in chapter 15, if you remember this in chapter 15, God is going to tell Saul in the middle of his defiance, when he's removing his blessing from him, he's going to look at Saul and he's going to say, hey, Saul, your disobedience and your rebellion, he says, is like the sin of witchcraft and divination. And this is what he tells him. He says, your rebellion and your disobedience, it's like the sin of witchcraft and divination. And the irony is that here he is just chapters later, years later, and here he is actually engaging in literal witchcraft before the Lord. And I think it's fascinating because I think it's very similar to some of the things that we see today. I was reading an article a little while ago. It was talking about how studies have shown that his participation in organized religion has gone down in our country today superstitious practices, things like tarot cards and crystals and amulets and palm reading and energy balancing and chakra work, they've all gone up. Isn't that fascinating? And not only that, but he says that the more irreligious a person describes themselves to be, the more likely they are to be superstitious. And so he goes on and he, he talks about how Hollywood is the least religious, most superstitious place in America today. He talks about all kinds of stories Hollywood, some of our favorite actors and actresses and some of the different things that they believe. We're not into organized religion. We don't believe in God. However, we do believe these things over here. Cameron Diaz wears a lucky necklace because she thinks it has mystical anti-aging abilities. Jennifer Aniston <laughs> always taps the outside of a plane with her right foot before she gets on it. And then she steps on the plane with the same foot because that's going to protect her and keep her safe. Rafi Nadal, the famous tennis player, only crosses lines on the court with his right foot between points, and he always turns his tournament ID face up on the bench, and then he always turns his water bottle to face the exact same direction to help align the energy that's there on the court. Uh, I love this one. Megan Fox, she copes with her fear of flying by only listening to Britney Spears during the flight because she says, I know for a fact it's not in my destiny to die while I'm listening to Britney Spears' album, right? <laughs> Uh, I love that one. I think that one might have a little bit of credibility to it and stuff. But, um, and of course, the point that he makes in the middle of it all is that even in the denial of God, you can still see the hunger for the divine. I think it's fascinating. And of course, the enemy would love to help you find a voice apart from the one who he knows will actually bring you life. It's exactly where Saul is here in this text. And so here he is, and he's talking out to a witch. Samuel continues, continues, and he speaks to him with some bad news, and he says, The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with them. It's not the message you want to hear from a ghost. Anybody that's conjuring up that, hey, tomorrow you're going to be with me, it means it's not going to go very well. And it's how the story plays out. You turn the page to chapter 31. They're fighting against the Philistines where both Saul and Jonathan are killed. We read in verse 8. That on the next day when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. 
They cut off his head. They stripped off his armor. They sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among their people. They put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. And this is how his story ends, and the entire book wraps up in 1 Samuel. It's not exactly the picture of a king that they were hoping for, probably in the very beginning, was it? We see a brand of empty religiosity that is being warned against today. You're seeing this all throughout his life, that, um, that there's a difference between using God and worshiping him. And you see this in Saul, that he's a believer in Yahweh. He has faithful years. He walks with them for a short amount of time. He does some things right. He's faithful in some different ways. However, there's a warning because there's a difference between using God for your means, using God for your purposes, and actually submitting to him, serving him, worshiping him in all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The author of First Chronicles is going to write about this and say that even though he was one who believed in Yahweh, even though he did pray and seek God, he's going to say in First Chronicles 10, 13, that Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord, and he also consulted a medium seeking guidance. And then he says he did not seek guidance from the Lord. And, of course, we read that, and you're sitting there going, okay, I thought that he was seeking the Lord. He was asking God for guidance, and he was asking God for deliverance and all these different kinds of things. But, of course, the point that the author is making right here is that there is a way to use him. There is a way to seek his blessing that is not the same as seeking him. There's a way to say, I want your things, I want your blessing, I want goodness in my life. I need you to come alongside me that has no desire to submit to him or worship him whatsoever. I love the way Larry Crabb talks about this when he says, our problem is that we often don't want to find God in order to know him. We want to find him and use him so that, we can, so that he can make our lives work. And it's exactly how it plays out with King Saul. He wants a co-pilot in his life. He doesn't want a king. He wants Siri to come in and to help give him instructions when he gets off path a little bit to kind of course correct and reroute his path and things like that. But he wants to determine his own path. And so he prays. He's someone who's seeking God in prayer sort of over here, but he really only prays when he's afraid. And he seeks God, but he really only seeks God whenever he needs to be delivered and when he needs the battle uh, to be won. And of course, he wants his guidance, but again, it's only when it's serving his own means. Meanwhile, you see the contrast between Saul and David play out clear as day. And David's out there worshiping no matter the situation. He's saying things like, there's one thing I've asked of the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, simply to behold his beauty and to be able to meditate in this temple. In other words, of all the things that I could ask God in the world, that's the thing that I want. God, I want to see you. I want to behold you. I want to meditate in your temple. I want to know your heart. I want to know your mind. I want to know your ways. God, all I want is you, whether you are blessing me in the moment or not, God. The thing that I want more than anything else in my life is you. It's David when he's writing Psalm 150, and he says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his mighty heavens. Praise him for the acts of his power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him from the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. In other words, I don't care if we're here at church. I don't care if we're at the temple. I don't care if I'm lost in the woods. I don't care if I'm sitting there in the middle of my neighborhood. No matter where I may be, in good times or in bad times, this voice is able to praise the God, praise God Almighty. In other words, like I don't need the harp. I don't need the lyre. All I can use is my voice. It's him when he writes Psalm 9. And he says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud for the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and with song. And so we have to see this contrast between Saul and David. And we have to ask, okay, when was the last time that my heart just exploded with worship to the Lord? Like when was the last time that I wasn't being prompted, I wasn't being forced, I wasn't being pressured? But what God was doing, the reality of who he is, was so alive inside of my soul that my mouth sang his praises no matter where I was. Like, when was the last time that 
that my prayers were filled with an abundance of gratitude and praise and not just an overwhelming amount of requests. God, I need you to deliver me here. God, I need healing over here. God, I need you to provide over here. God, I need you to fix this situation over here. God, I need to know which job is going to be best for me and my family. God, I need, I need, I need, I need versus the God, here's who you are. I recognize you in all of your beauty, all of your holiness, all of your goodness, all of your glory. I recognize you're the one who speaks and things come to being. I recognize that you're the one who holds the world in the palm of your hand. And so I recognize that you and you alone are the only one who is worthy. Church, when was the last time your heart exploded in worship? David's going to write, you can enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. You can give thanks to him and you can always praise his name. In other words, when you're not praising him for his things, you can always praise his name. Now he's Emmanuel, God with us. The one who came to be near us, you can always praise his name. You can always praise his character. Psalm 99, 5, exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footsteps. Why? Because he's holy. He's so other than, he's unlike anything you've ever seen. He's unlike anything you've ever known. He is perfect in all of his ways. He is holy, and by virtue of him being holy, he is always worthy of being praised. When was the last time you prayed? Simply because you've been given access to the kingdom, to the throne room of God. Like when was the last time you prayed and got down on your knees, not needing anything from him, but simply because you can't? When was the last time we sacrificially gave without a begrudging spirit? When was the last time we served him and gave up the comforts of our lives simply because he and he alone would get all the glory from it? I love the way Elizabeth Elliot talks about this. She's a famous missionary, a hero in a lot of Christian circles and everything, and faithful woman of God. And I love the way that she talks about her own calling. She was being asked how in the world she stayed faithful when she endured so much persecution and so much suffering and opposition all throughout her life. And I loved her response because it was the last thing you would expect to hear in a response to that question. But she explained it like this. She said, if the distance between the sun and the earth were the thickness of a piece of paper, then the distance between earth and the closest star would be a stack of paper 70 feet high. The distance across our galaxy would be a stack of paper 310 miles high. And our galaxy is but a speck of dust on the floor of the Sahara Desert. And the Bible says that God upholds all of us by the word of his power. Is that really the kind of God that you treat like an existent? (laughs) No. It's the kind of God you gladly give everything back to in worship of him. And yet we treat him like Siri all the time. God, I need you right now because I need a little bit something better in my life. True God in my life really is comfort. It really is luxury. It's the life of ease. It's the life of blessing. I'll take your blessing even if it means I don't have you. It's the warning around Saul's life. There's a way to use him that doesn't worship him. And there's another warning in here about the difference between sorrow and repentance. And I think it's one that we need to pay attention to because what we're going to see here is that there is a way to grieve your sin that has no desire to repent. I was having a fascinating conversation with a counselor friend a little while ago, and he said, I've sat with many a people on the couches over the years in my office, seen a lot of tears from people that had absolutely no intention of changing anything in their life. There's a lot of spouses that cry and say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I need you to forgive me. I need you to forgive me again. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me and have no intention of changing anything in their life. There's a lot of confession in small groups that come back and they're like, well, did it again. Yep, did it again. Yep, yep, well, all right, falling on the grace of God. I have no desire of anything changing, any walking in victory ever. And this is the warning around Saul's life. Chapter 15, the blessings of the kingdom are being removed from his life. And at that point, he's sorry. No, God, I'm sorry. No, 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 not that, not that. Like, don't take that from me. Don't take, like, no, 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 no. And nothing changes in his life. It's what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 7. When he says this, and I love this, he says, even if I caused you sorrow in my letter, I don't regret it. You ever read the epistles, Paul's letters and stuff? And you're like, well, that was a little bit tough. He's like, even if I caused you sorrow in my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but it was only for a little while, yet now I'm happy. (laughs) 
<laughs> not because you were made sorry, and I love this, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. Man. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so you weren't harmed in any way by us. For there's a godly sorrow that brings a repentance leading to salvation and no regret. But there's a worldly sorrow that produces only death. In other words, there's a way to grieve the embarrassment of being caught. There's a way to grieve the consequences of our sin. There's a way to grieve the shame of our failures and our shortcomings. But he's going, if that's all that it is, that kind of grief will never be able to lead to life. Meanwhile, there's a godly sorrow, he says right here, that brings with it a repentance. And that kind of grief will always, always, always lead to life. And that's the question that we've got to figure out here today. Do I actually believe that there's life on the flip side of repentance? That I'm not entitled to anything because life is, the fullness of life is found on the flip side of of repentance, that I'm not entitled to any of these things, but I can look to Christ in the middle of my sin, not only in sorrow, but in total surrender, saying, Father, I recognize that all the different things you're flooding my mind and my soul with right now, God. I recognize that all of these different things, God, they're yours. I'm laying them down before you, and as best as I can by the power of your Holy Spirit, I want to turn from these things. I want to hand them over to you. I know it may take time. I know it might be five steps forward, two steps back. I know it might mean that I need to jump into a recovery group or confess some sin with a a life group or small group of people or accountability or friends or family or things like that, and I know it may be tough, and I know it doesn't seem all these things, but God, I'm trusting that in this moment that you and you alone are the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And I'm trusting that what you're telling me will really bring life into my, into my soul. And the question is, okay, do I really believe that? Do I really believe that life is found on the flip side of repentance or do I actually believe, no, 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 life is found when I'm choking it, when I'm running with my own way in the same way that Saul does and says, yeah, 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 God, that's great advice that you gave me about the Amalekites, but guess what? Life is really going to be found when I do things my way. Do we really believe that life is found on the flip side of repentance? A few years back, David Kinnaman wrote a book called Unchristian. Uh, Part of it was an uh, extensive study that compared the lives of Christians with non-Christians to see if there was any notable moral differences between us. It's an interesting study. Typically, I kind of get a little cynical of some of those because a lot of times we know that we can, it's easy to identify as a Christian and uh, Christ in Matthew uh, 25 is going to say, yeah, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will actually be saved. Nevertheless, this particular study made, uh, made you make a profession of faith and do all these different kinds of things that I thought was pretty credible. Anyway, the study was fascinating because it revealed a lot of great things about, um, about believers. said that Christians are less angry, cuss less than other people in public. I guess that's good. We're not cussing everyone out. And so uh, um, <laughs> Christians are typically more generous. Uh, they give a lot of money to the poor. It's a fantastic mark. Christians are a lot more involved in charitable work and community service. We buy fewer lottery tickets than anyone else. <laughs> so those are some good things, I guess, anyway. It goes on and it says that Christians are almost as likely as anyone else to visit a pornographic website in the past week within a 5% probability as anyone else. Just as likely as anyone else to get drunk, to deal with materialism, greed, pride, illegal drugs, to take prescription medicine that's not prescribed to them, just as likely as anyone else, almost, to lie in order to get out of, the, out of a difficult situation. Almost as likely to seek vengeance on somebody who's done something to us in the past 30 days. Just as likely to have gossiped about a friend in the past 30 days. And he wraps up the entire study and all of his findings, and I think his commentary around it was profound. He said, it's really, really unfortunate because it means that there's a lot of well-intentioned Christians today who will never know the freedom and joy of the repentant life. And church, that's what's, that's what's at stake with the unrepentant life. In fact, Jesus may, he says in Matthew chapter 25, it could mean you're not really saved. You continue in unrepentance and there's no check of the Holy Spirit leading you back to him, leading you to turn and to remove from these things. He says, hey, there's a lot of people that are going to call on me and say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, depart from me. I never even knew you. 
You acknowledged some things that were right in your head, but it never trickled down, and there was never this wholehearted reception of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, for the genuine believer, it could also mean the absence of freedom, the absence of joy, the absence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit we pray for and long for all the time, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It could mean less and less glory to our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the world in which we live. So here's Saul. And it's like he's forgotten that there's mercy on the flip side of repentance. And I hope and pray that none of us forget that today. That when we talk about warnings, we talk about repentance and coming back to him and laying down sin, being honest uh, before our God and our maker, we have to understand that there is mercy on the flip side of repentance. I mean, David's going to fall into a, a very similar trap years later, but the difference is that he doesn't just grieve, he honestly repents. And Solomon's going to fall into a lot of the same trappings, and somehow God still gives him favor. And there's going to be all kinds of wicked kings that follow in their footsteps, and they're not actually going to repent. And then there's going to be all these years of silence at the close of the Old Testament at the end of Malachi right there. And then guess what? The Word becomes, becomes flesh and chooses to dwell among us. And when Jesus comes on the scene, it's like anything else. It's like nothing else that you've ever seen. He comes on, and in the middle of failure in the middle of Peter and his denial of even knowing who Jesus is. He comes and he says, hey, Peter, I'm not done with you, brother. I'm not done with you. Now go and feed my sheep. And he goes to Saul, who's not the same Saul as this one that we're talking about right here, the one who would later become the Apostle Paul, the chief persecutor of the church, the one who was killing Christians before he saw the resurrected Christ. And he says, Saul, I'm not done with you. I want you to go to the Gentiles. I want you to write nearly half the New Testament. He goes to the woman who's caught in adultery and says, is there no one left to condemn you? Neither do I. Now go and sin no more. And even in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon we see in the New Testament, Jesus is preaching to the people and he's blowing their mind because he keeps rising the bar of righteousness left and right. And you remember this speech, he keeps saying things like, hey, you've heard it said this, but I'm telling you it's even higher than that. You've heard it said that you shouldn't do this, but I'm telling you, you want to know what holiness and righteousness is? It's something like you haven't even believed, and the people are freaking about, out about it, and they're going like, like, we couldn't even do this down here. How in the world are we going to do this up here? And you remember what he says to him? He says, take heart for the Son of Man didn't come to abolish the law or to minimize the law in any way. I came to fulfill it on your behalf. It's the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ towards you and to me. Sinners broken before a holy God who come and honestly say, God, all of these things, I'm laying it down before you. There's a, there's a, there's a reception. There's a mercy. There's a peace. There's a goodness and, uh, and a reception of grace on the flip side of this repentance. That's why he says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ came and he died on our behalf. He lived the sinless life we could not live. And he willingly went to the cross and he suffered and he bled and he died so that any and all who would come to him in genuine, repentant faith may have life now and for all of eternity. That's why Paul's able to say, such were some of you, but you've been washed by the shed blood of the Lamb. Those things have been your past. They're no longer who you are. You've been given the power of the Holy Spirit. You can change. It doesn't need to stay the same. You've been justified and you've been declared righteous, not because of your perfectionism, but because of the Christ, the Son of God, who was perfect on your behalf. In the life, that the justification that he gave you when you came to him in genuine faith. That's why he says, as many as have believed in him, to them he's given the right to be called children of God. That is what is waiting for us on the flip side of repentance. That's why Paul's going to say in Romans chapter 2 that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance today. And it's absolutely true that there is life, there is grace, and there is mercy waiting for us on the flip side of repentance. And so it's true. We're not entitled to anything. We're not entitled to anything. And I hope we go back and we sit with that for a little bit this afternoon, that we come back and that you look around at your life, that you look around maybe at the people that are in your life, the ones that you've come to enjoy, and you're sitting there going, the joy that I have with this person, I'm not entitled to it. 
I'm not entitled to the joy that I have with the kids. I'm not entitled to the joy that I have on this street or in this home or in this fellowship or in this community and the freedom in the country in which we live and all these different kinds of things. I'm not entitled to any of these things because life is found on the flip side of repentance. And the truth of the gospel is he lavishes us with grace and with mercy every single day, even though we're not entitled to any of these things. My hope and my prayer for us today is that Every single ounce of entitlement that we may feel would absolutely be shattered today. That we would just let it go. I would just tell you this past couple of weeks, just sitting there in the sobriety, talking about it with so many people in my life, has been a, just a beautiful time of prayer to be able to come and to say, I'm just not entitled to any of these things, God. You could easily remove any blessing, any favor. You could easily do that, God, any time. These are all gifts of your mercy and your grace but that every ounce of entitlement would absolutely be shattered, that our hearts will be flooded with worship, recognizing there's a way to use God for his blessings. There's a way to use God so that my life would be promoted, and there's a way to submit to him in all things and to worship, that our hearts would be flooded with worship today, and that there would be a godly sorrow that permeates our body that, allow us, that would allow us to find life on the flip side of repentance, all for the praise and for the glory of his name. And so, Jesus, we just want to tell you, God, we love you. We do worship you. Your mercy and your grace is abundant. It's everywhere. Lord, our confession, it's easy to take it for granted to feel entitled to these things. It's easy to feel entitled to the throne. It's easy to feel entitled to your ever-present voice, always leading us in every possible way because you've been so faithful to do that for so long. It's easy to feel entitled to so many different things, and God, we sit here humbly, recognizing that your hand of mercy and grace is all around our lives. We come back to you, Father, and we just simply say thank you. Would you fill us with gratitude as we see your hand all over the place? Would we be filled with a godly sorrow that it would allow us to find life on the flip side of repentance, that we would know the joy of freedom, that we would know the joy of your love and the peace which surpasses all understanding. God, would you set us free? So church, I just want to give you a moment, whatever you came in with today, would you ask him to examine your heart, your mind, wherever you may be, whatever you came in with today that you would know that there's mercy waiting on the flip side of repentance. It's a safe place to repent, that this would be a church that's safe for people to repent in. <laughs> but would you just take a few moments and lay these things down before the Lord and say, God, would you take my sorrow and turn it into repentance today, that I would know the freedom that you've called me to walk in. Father, we do love you. God, we praise you. Would you grab hold of all of our affections and fill us with worship today? It's in Jesus' mighty and holy name that we pray. Amen and amen.